today's top boxing news. Ow! Okay, we'll start with this. It appears that the prediction stuck and the people at the World Boxing Council have gone ahead and ordered the fight between Jadeja Green, the mandatory challenger to the WBC title, the newly vacated title, and Franchon Cruz, the former champion, formerly undisputed. The title became vacant after Savannah Marshall had been declared a champion in recess by the organization earlier this month and saying Green would be one of the fighters competing for the newly vacated title. Green and Cruz Desern almost fought earlier this year. Green had been the mandatory challenger when Cruz Desern was the undisputed champion, but Cruz Desern instead fought Marshall. Now, the two will get in the ring with the title on the line, at least one of them. The other three, they stay with Savannah. Franchon Cruz and Savannah Marshall fought under the predication that the winner of the fight, whoever it was, would have to fight Jadeja afterwards, but the winner of the fight was Savannah, who's out of commission for the rest of this year. She's said to have some kind Kind of an injury so she's on the bench and labeled a champion in recess the wbc title is up for grabs this is what i said would happen so how's this fight breakdown well whoa, whoa, comparatively whoa. french on cruise the former champion who has at least one common opponent with jean deja green in Aline cedar ruse french on has comparatively faced better fighters than Jadeja. Than she has. Been in there with Clarissa Shields, Alejandra Jimenez, Aline Cedar Ruz, who I just mentioned, but also Maricela Cornejo two times, Savannah Marshall. Experience goes to Franchon, just in terms of experience, who's been in there with better fighters, win or lose, Franchon has. But based on styles, it's actually Jadeja who's the comparatively greener fighter. It's Jadeja who's got the stylistic advantage. The pressure fighter versus the boxer puncher, the counter puncher, that usually favors the counter puncher. Pressure fighters spend so much time trying to close the distance and get close to their opponent, what normally works for them works against them, against the counter puncher. Opening up so much, you give the counter puncher all the countering opportunities they need. Counter punchers use aggression against their opponents. Think Javante Davis, think Teofimo Lopez. They like to make the punches count. They don't often waste punches. Thing about counter punchers, bit of a drawback, they ain't got much of a work rate characteristic they don't often put that many punches together. When they do let their hands go, they like to make it count. The sniper's like that. They're economic. They like to take their time and pick their shots, pick their punches. With French on, she's going to try to crowd you, smother you, overwhelm you. Stand in front of you and let him go. So Jadeja's not going to have to find French on in there. French on will find her. And it's up to Jadeja to beat those feet, create space, and get off those counters as to not be overwhelmed by Franchon. It's a good fight. I think jadeja has got the edge in speed, speed the edge speed, in power. Speed. I think she punches harder than Franchon, just not as often as Franchon. That's why she's got to create space. If she makes herself a stationary target, things could get messy. And that works in Franchon's favor. That's her kind of fight. Jadeja Green is promoted by most valuable promotions, and in all likelihood, they're going to bankroll the show. To my knowledge, Franchon is a network and promotional free agent, so it should be a fairly simple, fairly easy fight to negotiate so long as Franchon actually wants it. That's the question. Is she willing to go in there with Jadeja coming off a loss to Savannah? Tough fight. Though there isn't exactly an abundance of alternatives at 168 pounds, an abundance of options. For Christ's sake, Celine Cedarouz just retired earlier this week. Not a lot of people to fight at those weights. Familiar names, the good ones, they kind of have to fight each other or risk not fighting. Not fighting at all, not making any money. There's no alternate path to a world title at 168. Savannah still has the other three titles and she just beat Franchon. Thus, Franchon's only other option is to fight Jadeja. Gotta do it. The WBC were very Johnny on the spot with this order. You wonder why they don't keep that same energy for Jermall Charlo, WBC champion in men's boxing in the middleweight division. This is a guy who hasn't boxed in two going on three years. It's looking more and more like he's not going to box at all this year. Why were they so in a hurry to label Savannah a champion in recess and not him? Bribes. All likelihood, Jermall or someone on Jermall's behalf is paying the WBC to let him keep that belt. So what they're losing and sanctioning fees to sanction the fights that he's not having they're getting back in bribes. Bribes. What it is. Bribes. We'll see how long it takes most valuable promotions to make this fight for the newly vacated WBC title. If Franchon wants it, if she's receptive to the fight, then it shouldn't take long. Before we got to this point, Jadeja Green was already in pursuit of a fight with Franchon, so she's just building off of what she was already doing. Does Franchon want the fight? That's the question.
Batman Super Middleweight News, Oscar De La Hoya says John Ryder would be perfect for Jaime Munguia. The chance to do something Canelo couldn't do. Knock him out. Canelo Alvarez fought John Ryder south of the border in his last fight when John was his WBO mandatory challenger. He beat him in one-sided fashion, dropped him two times. All he didn't do was knock him out. John's a tough guy. And Jaime Munguia is no Canelo Alvarez. Given that Alvarez is coming off a tougher than expected points win over Ryder in the spring, De La Hoya is enthralled by the notion that Munguia could one-up Alvarez by stopping Ryder. I love that fight with Ryder, De La Hoya told Fight Hub TV. It's a great fight. Ryder gave Canelo all he could handle and he went 12 rounds with him. He hit him, busted him up. I think Ryder would be a perfect opponent, a perfect name for Jaime Munguia. It'll be difficult. It'll be a tough fight. Imagine if Jaime Munguia could knock him out, something that Canelo could couldn't do. Are you ready to put up the kind of money that would get John to fight Jaime? I've no doubts that as Canelo's WBO mandatory challenger, John Ryder was able to make a nice chunk of change. He's under no obligation to face Jaime Munguia, thus, if you want to make a fight with him while he's coming off a loss and hasn't had a rebound fight, it's going to cost you. You got to pay to play. I figured as soon as that fight was over that because it took place in front of a largely Mexican crowd, a large Largely Mexican audience that Oscar would pursue this for Jaime next. Pursue this behind that. Behind the Canelo fight. There's some opportunities out there for Jaime, and we're looking at November and December, most likely November, to bring him back, De La Hoya said. I do have to say that it has been difficult to find him opponents. It has been difficult because either they're fighting already, already scheduled opponents, or they're not ready. Either the date is too soon or too late. It's always something. Hopefully we can nail something down. We can have a couple of names other than Ryder. It'll be interesting to see who's going to going to fight. Jaime Munguia. He's coming off a war with Sergei Didivianchenko, and I've got nothing against Sergei, but the version of him that Jaime fought. I knew it was going to be difficult for Jaime, and I said as much before the fight that even though Sergei Didivianchenko has been through the ringer, he's already been in there with Golovkin and Daniel Jacobs, Jermon Cholo and Carlos Adames, and lost all four of them. He's still going to be able to give Jaime a hard fight, a difficult night, because Jaime is that limited. He is that one dimensional. And that's what happened. We want to fast track him, De La Hoya said. What? We want him to fight for the world title already. He's ready. He's there. He's on a mission. And that mission is to become a world champion and hopefully one day fight Canelo. Do you know why he's not a mandatory challenger yet at 168? It's because of the guys he would have to go through. The guys standing in the way of him. The guys ranked above him. That's why. I mean, if he tried to go by way of the WBA, the WBA route, he'd bump into David Morrell. I risk low reward. If he tried to go by way of the WBC, he'd have to fight David Benavidez. There was a preliminary set of talks, negotiations between Team Benavidez and Team Munguia, but we know that didn't work out. You're a day late the dollar short by way of the WBO. Yeah, you're looking to fight John Ryder now, now that he's not Canelo's mandatory challenger. Well, admit it would have been difficult to get him in the ring while he was still in position because he'd be gambling a shot at the biggest name in boxing right now. So they likely wouldn't have got him anyway. But you see what I mean? That if Jaime isn't already in position to challenge Canelo, it's because they're treading carefully. They're being cautious. When you have a fighter as limited as Jaime Munguia, you have to be. They are. I don't have any illusions about Jaime Munguia and what he can do. In fact, nobody does. That's why when you say the guy's protected, everybody agrees, which is saying a lot because people in boxing, they can't seem to agree on anything, but they agree on that. He's protected. He's a fun, albeit very limited and protected fighter to watch. That's what he is, and that's what I take him for. I take him for what he is. A fun, albeit very limited fun fighter to watch what he is a fight between him and john south of the border that'll put some asses in some seats now that john is acquainted himself with the mexican boxing community you could sell it and it'll be entertaining though don't get it in your head that because canelo beat this guy easy that jaime would beat him easy jaime ain't canelo he can beat him he can probably beat him but he'll have to labor he'll have to work to do it just in keeping with the theme of all things Golden Boy Promotions, Zerto Ramirez likes the idea of moving up one day to fight Anthony Joshua. Want to go to the hospital? Zerto was always a big guy for 168, big guy at 175, though not necessarily a big puncher, not the biggest. It's not saying he was pillow fisted. That's saying that there was nothing spectacular about his power. It didn't stand out. And how's it going to look now that he's campaigning as a cruiserweight? I want to challenge myself, said Ramirez, to Little Giant Boxing 
when asked if he sees himself fighting Joshua in the future. Why not move up to heavyweight one day? I've sparred before with heavyweights. I feel great. How would he feel at heavyweight? Getting hit by a heavyweight. Zerto Ramirez is one of these guys who, for the longest time, has relied on his physically imposing size. I mean, I think the guy's about six foot two, six foot three. That's big. big. That's actually very big, big for a super middleweight and a light heavyweight. That's big. But at cruiserweight, where he is now campaigning, well, that's not so big. The size advantage, the height advantage, the length, you won't have those advantages as a cruiserweight. Cruiserweights are usually just the nose hair removed from heavyweights. They're basically just heavyweights on a diet. He's not going to be the biggest guy in the room as a cruiserweight, let alone a heavyweight. He says, I'm focusing on this fight with Joe Smith Jr. Joe Smith Jr., like Zerto Ramirez, is a light heavyweight moving up in weight. I have no complaints about the fight. I think it promises to be an all-action shootout. A fun fight because Joe's a puncher and so is Zerto. I'm looking forward to it. Don't make no mistake. There is a reason that Zerto is making his cruiserweight debut against a former light heavyweight champion. Not a former cruiserweight champion, a former light heavyweight champion, a former light heavyweight like himself. Zerto never realized his goal at light heavyweight to become a champion there. There's a reason for that. Dimitri Bivol. A large part of Zerto Ramirez's identity as a fighter, believe it or not, relies on his height, on his length, on his size. And when that cannot avail him... He got the boxing brain to compensate the boxing acumen he actually had height and length on dimitri bivol he had those advantages but what he didn't have is dimitri's boxing brain zerto's not cerebral he never was i don't think he's gonna start now it's a different set of challenges now at cruiserweight depending on who you bump into up there you're not gonna be the biggest guy in the room that if you mean the challenge for an alphabet title in the cruiserweight division a lot of those guys up there are as big as you are but they're acclimated and you're not they used to fight in cruiserweights and you're about to fight a light heavyweight a chunky one that cruiser want to talk about an anthony joshua fight what you're really talking about is a hospital bill overnight stay at the local hospital when he puts you there separates cerebral and multi-layered multi-faceted fighters from physical fighters is physical fighters like zerto rely on physicality for effectiveness and that can be stripped away the further up you go those advantages you had at one weight start to disappear the further north you go Let's see what happens now downstairs men's lightweight news showtime executive stefan espinoza yeah. recently took to social media to dispel rumors of a proposed javante davis versus keith thurman fight Ooh. saying y'all need to stop with the tank versus thurman stuff it's not happening stop believing everything you read on social media not all sources are the same this rumor gained traction a few days ago enough traction that stefan espinoza thought it important enough to dispel it dispel it publicly and he would know gervonta davis has been fighting on the showtime platform for eons even when the pbc struck that landmark deal with fox back when things were better. A lot of the PBC's fighters migrated over to Fox, but Gervonta was not one among them. He fights almost exclusively, if not exclusively, on Showtime. So when Stefan says there's no substance to the rumor, I do feel so inclined to believe it. FightHype.com, who's had close ties to Floyd Mayweather for years. They laughed at it. Via their social media saying, just laughed about this with Floyd. Tank ain't fighting Keith Thurman. That don't even make financial sense. Who makes this stuff up? Content creators not talented enough to make engaging content, so they lie for engagement. You've been seeing it for years. The line has been blurred. The line that separated those who report on the sport of boxing and those who are just fans of it. It seems these days that the fans themselves are the ones covering the sport, at least here in America, as it's not as mainstream as it used to be. And many fans have taken it upon themselves to report on the sport of boxing with mixed results. Now, some fans, they do so with a sense of integrity. Sense of duty. To the truth and talking about what is true, getting to it, and dispelling what isn't, where others like to make up their own news, make up their own news via their own quote-unquote sources for little more than engagement. Clickbait. That by the time people realize it's all bullshit, they got the clicks they wanted, got to make the money they wanted. The engagement, the attention. May have been a more meticulous eye for detail 
in previous eras of boxing because it was major news outlets covering the sport then and their journalists to go out there and get the stories and make sure they're accurate before they go to print. Whereas now, when you've got fans taking the reins, you're going to get mixed results. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. Leaving the door open for almost anyone with a platform of any kind, any kind of social media account, to manufacture their own rumors, thereby manufacturing their own news to get the desired engagement they're looking for. I held off on talking about this thing. I wanted to hear it from the horse's mouth before I do a segment on it. The rumors seem reasonable enough, though, because Keith's not busy with anything or anyone. I remember some preliminary rumors months ago preliminary rumblings about a potential Thurman versus Gervonta Davis fight. Keith Thurman very much being on his way out of the sport. What remains of his career? It didn't seem far-fetched that he might cash out with a catchweight fight against Gervonta, but I still held off on talking about it because I wasn't sure. Anybody can say anything these days. Every Joe Blow with a Twitter account claims to have inside intel, inside sources. So who is Javante Davis gonna fight in the fall? Served out his uh, sentence for that hit and run thing that happened one or two years ago. He's free, he's out now, and they're looking to secure him an opponent. Now, most people feel he's probably just gonna fight Isaac Cruz again. Probably. Some feel that the real reason that Frank Martin walked away from the Stevenson fight is because clandestinely, they may be planning a Javante Davis fight. Though Calvin Ford very recently made an appearance on a podcast, I forget the name, and he was hinting at something big, something major. I don't think a Frank Martin fight fits the bill. No. And even though Calvin has an expressed desire to run it back with Isaac Cruz, I don't think that a rematch with Isaac fits the bill either for something big, no. something major. The numbers that Javante Davis just did with Ryan Garcia, if you were to go in there with Isaac for a second time, you can bet your bottom dollar he don't hit those numbers. He don't come close to hitting those numbers. Bigger fights than a Frank Martin fight or an Isaac Cruz rematch would have to be fights with the likes of Shakur Stevenson, but he's spoken for. He's supposed to be fighting Edwin De Los Santos, Devin Haney, but Devin's supposed to be fighting Regis Progre, Tio Fimo. He's supposed to be coming back on Heisman night. Presumably against Jose Ramirez or somebody like that, somebody over there. So I don't know who Javante's about to fight. 